Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode number 69, featuring an interview with the maker of both the best and the worst games ever made for the Atari 2600, Mr. Howard Scott Warshaw. You're a fly named Yar on a quest in space. You attack the shield of the Kotile space, but watch out, Yar. He knows where you are, Yar's revenge is you. It's always a great treat for me. I think it's to sit down with somebody like Howard Scott Warshaw, one of these sort of towering figures of the earliest days of the video games industry. Now, of course, if you're not familiar with him, He's probably most famous for his uh, games, Yar's Revenge, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and of course E.T., a game that many critics um, cite as one of the primary reasons for the great video game crash of 83, 84, the Crash Christmas. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for us to imagine, I think, today uh, a world without a games industry. Uh, but back when Howard was, uh, was working on these games, uh, you know, it was a very different time. Uh, games hadn't been around for very long. Nobody knew really what was possible, uh, what was coming, whether this was a fad, um, you know, what the great, what the future of the industry would be. It was very uncertain. So I had a great conversation with Howard. I'm sure you're going to like it. So without further ado, here is Mr. Howard Scott Warshaw. Well, me getting into programming is kind of an interesting story because I avoided computers like plague until uh, midway through my college career. I mean, I had access to them in high school and stuff. I just never wanted to get near them. That wasn't where I was going to go. I was uh, at Tulane doing uh, uh, economics. I was uh, majoring in economics, and that was my plan was to go forward with that. And everybody kept telling me, if you don't have computers, you're not going to go anywhere with economics. So I said, okay, I'll try a computer course. I took this little half-credit Fortran, Fortran programming course, and I loved it. I just thought, oh, my God, this is it for me. <laughs> it's like... Because it's like, it's all fun. It's no homework. You just hang out and solve puzzles. It was great. So I just dove into computers. And that got me into computers themselves. And uh, I didn't get it. My first job programming was actually at Hewlett Packard doing uh, distributed systems, doing some of the first networks. I was one of the first people to actually work on, quote, the internet. Only back then it was the ARPANET. But I actually wrote packet switchers and node control software back in the late 70s for for the ARPANET, which turned into the internet. So that was kind of cool. And I liked that kind of programming. But when I got to Hewlett Packard, things were really kind of dull for me. It was, I always, I always thought of that as like the software pasture where programmers go to die. And uh, it just wasn't that interesting to me. I liked microprocessors and real time control programming. And so I was also kind of a wacky guy, particularly for Hewlett Packard. So one day, uh, one of the people I worked with, a guy named Vince comes up to me, and he goes, you know, my wife is telling me about some of the stuff that goes on where she works, and it sounds just like the stuff you do all the time. He goes, you'd probably find that pretty interesting. I said, oh, what, where does she work? He goes, well, it's a place called Atari. And so I went and talked to Atari, and, you know, they uh, had an interview there. And, and at first, they didn't want to make me an offer because they thought I would be too straight to work there with them. But uh, I just begged and, and pleaded with them to just give me a chance to try it. And uh, they did finally. And one thing led to another. And uh, it turns out I was not too straight to work at Atari. <laughs> Ray was a very interesting guy. Ray was, uh, Ray was a classical manager. He came from a huge company. And he was brought in as a classical manager to run Atari for Big Warner. And... The thing is that right then, nobody really understood software management. Certainly nobody in our management chain understood software management. And so Ray came in, and he was going to straighten this out, and he was going to produce a product and run it out there just like he had at plenty of other companies. Uh, what was weird for Ray was Ray himself, I think, was a very intelli intelligent, a very sensitive, and a very interesting guy. But when he put on his CEO coat, uh, he turned into... I think he sort of let go of a lot of the things that made him a very interesting guy and just turned into this classical manager who believes your position on the org chart determines how you get dealt with. So he wouldn't, he wouldn't relate to people as people so much as their positions. And that created a huge problem for people when dealing with software people. Programmers created this thing that's the intellectual blue collar. You know, blue collar workers traditionally, you know, they're not stupid, but they're, they were not 
dense with intellectuals, whereas programmers are. So the intellectual blue collar, the idea of a blue collar level worker that's as smart or smarter than the managers who are working with them was a relatively new phenomenon. And uh, Ray and his staff, they really weren't prepared to deal with this phenomenon. I do actually cover this thing of a typical day at Atari in the documentary Once Upon Atari, which can be found at onceuponatari.com, any listeners. But uh, a typical day at Atari was you'd come in, you know, basic. We had a rule at Atari is that you can't come in until you want to and you can't leave until you feel like it. So you would think that people wouldn't necessarily spend much time at work there. Yet people were there around the clock. There was always someone there, literally 24 hours a day. And there were some people who would come in in the morning and work, you know, late into the evening. There were some people who would come in, like in the late afternoon, and work through till morning. You know, you had all kinds of people working at various times around the clock. But there's always someone there. Because what we were doing was so much fun. It was so compelling to be there. We just wanted to be there. And the work was fun. And the people you're working with were so interesting. So you'd come in in the morning. You know, then, you know, people would roll up joints and you could smell the smoke going on, get a little stone here and there. We'd go to lunch. We had a thing called the MRB. You know, the MRB was a code. and You'd hear it over the loudspeaker, the MRB in so-and-so's office or MRB up on the roof or whatever, whatever it was. MRB was a marijuana review board. And so every once in a while, somebody wanted to get stoned, you know, wanted to get together and chat, you know, so we call an MRB. And actually, a lot of games got developed during MRBs. Uh, the Atari 2600 was a very limited capability machine that ended up getting taken way far beyond its uh, original proposed design parameters uh, through programming. Because the people who did the 2600, the 2600 was invented to do Pong and Tank. That was basically the idea. You know, you have two players, two missiles, one ball, and some play field. You know, this is a machine that is designed to do Tank. And the idea that people could take it as far as they did and go with it was unbelievable. I mean, you got to consider that initially you only had 2K for your whole program, and that was ROM. And then you had 128 bytes of RAM to deal with. Now, people today can't even really conceive of that because basically everybody works with RAM, you know, in the hundreds of megs to gigs, like it's unlimited. And there's no concept of a limitation of resource in a lot of game programming today. There is when you're trying to program graphics chips and stuff and trying to get polys out there. But, you know, program logic and things like that, it's basically free. Whereas back then, I mean, you got to think about the idea that today uh, you couldn't fit the average data structure for one component of a game today in an entire game space back then. And 128 bytes of RAM, that's, that's ridiculous. It's insane. So... What I liked about it was it really tested your creativity. You had a few chips. You had a few registers to play with. You had very little RAM. You had some ROM. And you had to make up new ways of using it. You know, to take a machine that was designed to do tank and actually do like Ms. Pac-Man on that machine, which they subsequently did, it's astounding. You know, it's amazing to think you can get that much out of it. And the people who designed the 2600, you know, like four or five years later, when they would see the variety and the style of games that were actually available on it, blew their minds. It absolutely, it was beyond their imagination. But, you know, that's the way really good invention goes, right? Because in really good invention, what people do is they create capacity and capability. They don't create a device, an end in and of itself. They create an ability, and what, shows is, what it shows is that even though the designers had a very specific end in mind, which is basically to do tank, uh, they created a system whose capability wasn't limited to that. It went way beyond it. Even though they didn't see exactly how, they still had the basic design smarts not to close the system or limit the system. And so it just opened it up in ways that, you know, it took a lot of very intelligent people and very creative people years to start to exploit and realize just how far you could go with it but it, it, it's amazing how far they got with it
Fly on warriors, fly. Attack. 